<laughs> okay, so last time we started chapter six, we went through a whole problem. That problem sort of encompasses everything you need to know, but it was long and arduous, so you know we need some more practice, I think. We're gonna do some more examples. I have three more examples I wanna do. But before that, I figured I'd tell you guys about some shortcuts. There are some things that you're going to have to grind through, like finding the steady states. That's just something you can solve the system and things like that. But there are other things that we can actually get done easier. So I figured I'd tell you about those. Two main ways to cut things a little bit short for you is the following. Um, one, um, given, remember our general formulas, they look like dn1 equals r1 n1. N1 over K1 minus N2 over A1. With R1, R2 positive. Right. Um, it sort of goes without saying that the K's and A's are positive. Uh, I'll write that down anyway. K1, K2, A1, 2, A2, 1, all positive, right? So given this case, which is a very typical case, I mean, on every final that's ever been given in this class, that was the case, where we're assuming all the populations are growing. Then, remember that part where we're doing stability arrows? And we had to test things in the differential equation? So we have like these two lines, and we have to test the regions for the arrows. It turns out in this situation, the top right, will always be this. There's actually no point in you testing it. Right? And there are several ways to see this. One, you can simply just look at the map, right? Like a good point to test will always be um, the intercepts, something like k1 comma k2, or is it a2? It's one of these. But remember, what happens is when you pick one of these numbers, I think it was the a's, a2 one a2. Anyway, what happened was you notice that one of these always became one, so you always got one minus one which was always going to leave you with a negative inside here, which times a positive will always give you a negative. So this guy's always going to tell you left, that guy's always going to tell you down for a similar reason. Another way to realize that this will always be the case is the other options don't make sense, right? I mean, what would it mean if your top right looked like this, for example? Both populations would be going off to infinity. Not realistic. It doesn't make sense. It makes sense that they'll both be going down towards something. So, and the other arrow directions, it depends if you're in this position, the other one would be weird, and in this position, the other one would be weird. This is the only one that makes sense, no matter sort of where you are, right? So, the top right, always gonna look like that. You don't have to actually test to find stability arrows. You just know, when you jump over a sign, you switch the arrow for that line, right? But the top right's always gonna be that, so you can just skip the testing part. A second shortcut. A12, comma, A21. So <coughs> second shortcut is called Lowe's method. It actually replaces the competition table. cases predict the end behavior. All right, meaning before we even do the problem, I can tell you who's going to survive and who will die using Lowe's method. Um, 
As far as I know, it's not an official method. I've never seen it in a textbook or from a Google search. It was actually invented by a friend of mine named Raymond Lowe. <laughs> so I called it Lowe's method. I told him, oh, really? That's nice. I'm going to show my class this. And what do you call it? He said, I don't have a name. OK, we'll call it Lowe's method. Right? He wanted to call it by his first name, which is in Chinese. Chi <laughs> Chung Lowe's method. And then he's like, if they can't pronounce it or spell it, they shouldn't get the credit. <laughs> I thought, you know, no one's going to be able to pronounce that. Come on, we're, we're English speakers. So I just called it Lowe's method, and I said, like, okay, they can use Lowe's method. So the method works in the following way. There is a diagram. sort of an X, and each region actually means something. So if you're over here, that region is the pens. Right? Um, if you're over here, this means both. If you're over here, this means N2. If you're down here, this means N1. The pens is the only competitive case. So basically, you're going to be doing stuff to end up in one of these regions. And based on what regions you end up with, you can know what's going to happen. right? Um, if you end up down here, it means N1 will survive, N2 will die. If you end up up here, it means N2 will survive, N1 will die. This means both will survive. And depends means it's competitive, meaning you don't know for sure who will survive. It depends on your initial conditions. The sizes of the populations initially will actually matter. Um, so how do we get to these arrows? Can I actually describe it without writing out some examples? Let's, for example, let's, let, let's do the first problem we did and do Lowe's method. Um, you will get arrows to describe the region you should be in. Example, let's say you have this X, and you have arrows going like this, pointing in that direction. It means you're in the depend space, right? right? Or if you get arrows pointing up, that means you're in the N2 case. Or if you get arrows pointing to the side, it means you're in the both case. Or if you get arrows pointing down, that means you're in the N1 case. Right? How do you get these arrows? Well, I'm going to show you an example. Let's do the, the problem we did last time. Remember what happened last time? Both populations survive, right? Which means if we actually do Lowe's method, we should end up with this one. Right? So let's actually show you how we did it. So this was the last example we did. D1, D2, 0.2, and 1. 1 minus N1 over 100 minus N2 over 50. N2, D2. So the X actually comes from this box right here. Right? So you match up the N1s and you match up the N2s. Right? And the arrowhead goes towards the smallest denominator. So in this case, among the n1s, who's the smallest denominator? The 100, right? This is 200, that's 100. It means the arrowhead goes towards here. Right? Among the n2s, who's the smallest? 25, so the arrowhead would goes towards here. So in this case, you have that diagram. That means both will survive. And it also means non-competitive at the same time. <clears throat> so 
So we didn't do the competition table. We didn't have to write down the numbers in this table and see who's bigger than who. You sort of just do this method, and it tells you what the outcome will be and whether or not it's competitive. Competitive is only this right side. All the other three sides are non-competitive. And that's basically it. So you can sort of know ahead of time where your curve should go, where your solution curve should go, and at the same time tell if it's competitive or not without any numbers. It's just sort of noticing a pattern but of the denominators. So the remaining examples, I'm going to be using these shortcuts to try to get through them a little bit quicker. And yeah, that's what we're going to be doing for the rest of the class. So pick up on our second example. We're going to do this example, right? Goes to what is the smallest denominator. That's how you draw the arrow here. And that is called Lowe's method. It tells you about competitiveness and the long-term behavior all in one shot. Yes? Are the problems always set up like this, or are they like this? Yeah, they'll be set up like this. They'll say, this system of equation describes the population, blah, 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 and solved by qualitative methods or something like that. Um, in the review forms, you'll see how the questions are asked. Uh, so, let's actually do this one. So, let's figure out, remember, overall the question was to do qualitative analysis and tell me about the competitiveness of the system. So, let's talk about the first thing, competitiveness. Is it competitive or not? How do we figure it out? Can do Lowe's method, right? Look at the N1s, smallest denominator is here. So the arrow goes there. Look at the N2, smallest denominator is here, arrow goes here. Right? So we have this situation, that means N1, so it means non-competitive. N1 survives. Yeah? Could, there, could you have ever like have the same denominator? It's possible, yeah. But it, it will, it's very unlikely in your case. Um, you'll need some more calculations. If, if that happens, you'll need to sort of go back to the way you've done it before. But you still probably would get less information than you have here. You you need to go dig deeper, actually. Like, start plotting things point by point and watching the numbers. So it's very unlikely for you to get that situation. They tend not to be unique. But yeah, I can tell you right away, it's not competitive. And I can even tell you who will survive. N1 will survive, N2 will actually die in this case. Let's actually see if this is actually happened. So 2, now we're going to do the analysis. What was step 1? Steady states. How do we find them? Set these equal to 0, right? So you can usually just ignore these coefficients here. So N1 times 1 minus N1 over 50 minus N2 over 50 equals 0 and n2. So this is equation 1, that's equation 2. What was our method here? See what works in 1. So from 1, you have n1 equals 0, or 1 minus n1 over 50 minus n2 over 50 equals 0, which means 50 minus n1 minus n2 equals 0, which means n1 is equal to 50 minus n2. So you have these two situations. Either n1 is 0, or n1 is 50 minus n2. 
and then we consider each situation separately. So n1 equals 0, what happens to equation 2? This part is gone. or n2 equals 25. So you get two steady states here, 0, 0, or 0, 25. Those are your steady states here. So then 1 is equal to 50 minus n2. Go back to 2 and you plug that in for n1. We would get then 2 1 minus n2 over 25 minus 50 minus n2 over 20 equals 0. So I get n2 equals 0, or I would have 1 minus n2 over 25 minus 50 minus n2 over 20 equals 0. How do I solve this one? Okay, multiply through by the LCD. What is the LCD here? It's 100. Both, it's the smallest number that both 25 and 20 can go into. So I can multiply by 100. I would end up with 100 minus, this goes into 100 four times, so that's 4. 20 goes into 100 five times, so that's 5 times 50 minus 82. So here I would have 5 times 50 is 250, right? Mm -hmm. That's minus 250 plus 100. I have minus 150. I have minus 4n2 plus 5n2. That's plus 1n2, which means n2 is equal to 150. minus n2. And if n2 is 150, then this means n1 is minus 50, right? Because it's 50 mi minus, what is it? It's n1 is 50 minus n2. So I minus 150 from 50, that's minus 100. So here I get 50 comma 0, here I get minus 100 comma 150. Those are the other two states. So there are four steady states in total. And now, you remember what we graphed to get our phase plots? We graph the inside of the brackets equal to zero. Remember, that's what we did. So we want to graph 1 minus n1 over 50 minus n2 over 50 equals zero. This is the n1 null. And 1 minus n2 over 25 minus n1 over 20 equals zero. That's the n2 null. equation, if n2 equals 0, n1 equals 50. Mm -hmm. 
And if n1 equals 0, n2 equals 50. So that's this one. This is the n1 null point. In the second case, if n2 equals 0, n1 equals 20. And if n1 equals 0, n2 equals 25. And so you connect these two. What's going to happen is the intersection is going to be over here somewhere. Because right? that steady state was minus 100, 150. So this is the situation we find ourselves in. What do the arrows look like for the top? So Left and down, down, always. Which means if I move over here, how do, how do they change? No. Who did I pass? I jumped over the N1. N1 controls what? The X, horizontal. the horizontal. So it should be right and left down. Right and down. So move over here. It should be up and right. Up and right. And this region over here almost doesn't matter because it's in negatives anyway. We don't really care. But yeah, that's actually enough. And now you can sort of see what's going to happen. Let's say our initial was over here, for example. Let me start here at this initial. What would happen? Well, we'd go in this direction until we get this region. And then what do we do? We have to turn and go in that direction. So it's going to go. We end up in the situation where n1 survives, but n2 is 0 and one dies. Or what if I was over here? Then this, I'm in this region, which means I should be going up. So I'm going to go Once I'm in here, I have to go in this direction. So I'm going to start turning down like that. And up there again. Right? And this will happen almost anywhere. right? They'll all go back there. Oh, so anytime, so the y values would represent like the n2 population and the x. Would yeah, at any given time, you're thinking of this as the n1 population comma n2 population at a certain time. So you can run this experiment for a certain time. You end up here. That's the current population. The x coordinate gives you the current population for n1 and n2. And ultimately, where we're heading is this situation, where the n1 will end up with a population of size 50, and the n2 will be size 0. So this will never end up in the, I guess, because it can never have negative contributions. No, that situation is not. Especially we're thinking of this as population. Right? And these arrows sort of dictate where we should move, and they all sort of point to 50 eventually. Well, you have to remember the horizontal is n1, and the vertical is n2. And you change every time you jump over a null climb. This line here was the n1 null climb. It means every time I jump over that line, I need to switch the n1 arrow. So here, the n1 was left, which means if I jump over this line, it now has to move right. The n2 line doesn't change, because I didn't jump over the n2 line. But then if I move here to go over there, I jumped over the N2 line. So now the down arrow has to switch up, and this one stays. So that's how you do it. So we've, we've talked about how the top right will always sort of be this situation, and then you sort of look who you jump over to get to the other region. And then you switch whichever arrow is necessary. So if you jump over the N1 null climb, you have to switch the horizontal direction. 
you jump over the end two null time, you switch the vertical direction. Any other questions? Yeah? Mm -hmm. The x-axis uh, on the graph is n1, right? Yes, the, the horizontal is the n1, and the vertical is the n2. And the coordinates on these curves give you the current population at any given time. Any other questions? Is that for steady states? The part of the micro steady states? Yeah. The steady states will always be these intercepts. So if you notice, the origin is always a steady state, right? So you always have that. The other steady state was 0, 25, which is this. The other one is 50 comma 0, which is this. And the other one is actually the intersection. So we should be heading towards one of these spots. Because there are steady states, it's where we level off. But in this case, that's the only stable steady state. These are all unstable. Right? We're always running away from these guys towards that one. Would you mind going through graphing them again? Yeah. This one? Yeah. Okay, so remember what we graph? We look at the what's inside the brackets, set that equal to zero, and we graph that, right? So for the n1 null climb, you graph this equals zero. For the n2 null climb, you graph this equals zero. Okay? That's the first thing. The second thing to realize is that these are straight lines, right? If you think of this as x and that as y, what you're really graphing is 1 minus x over 50 minus y over 50. So how do you graph a straight line? Find any two points. The intercepts are usually nice points. So if I want to find the x-intercept, I plug in y equals 0, solve for x. That will give me x equals 50. So I know I plot x-intercept 50. Then if x equals 0, solve for y, I get y equals 50. So y-intercept 50, then connect the two points. It will always be the denominator. Yeah, it's always going to be the denominator. That's also a shortcut if you want to write it down. But, um, yeah, and I do the same thing here. Plug in n2 equals 0, and whatever is under here for n1 is what I'm going to plot, 20. Then I plug in n1 equals 0, which means n2 is 25, and so I plot that. And then you connect the two dots. Yeah? How do we know uh, 50 is stable in steady state? Lowe's method. From the very beginning, before we even started, we knew N1 would survive and it was non-competitive. That's what part one was about. Other questions? So we know that N1 will survive, right? Yeah. Lowe's method ended up with the arrows like this, and that tells us it's heading towards N1. So I know what our solutions look like. They should all be heading towards N1. So the steady states on N1 will survive? Yeah, N1 is the stable steady state. It's what our solution goes towards. Right? And all the others are unstable because we always run away. Aren't there two no, when I say n1, I'm assuming the other is 0. Oh. Right, so I'm thinking of this as n1, comma 0. Oh. Right, I write down whoever survives, so you assume the other one is dead. Okay. Right, so I'm going to approach the steady state that looks like something, comma 0, oh. which is going to be this one. Oh, okay. So I know I should be heading towards that point. Right? So it's the same thing, when I wrote up here n2, you assume it's 0, comma n2. And so you know in that case you would head towards the 0, 25 steady state. If you end up over here, that means both. You'll head towards a steady state where both are non-zero. Okay. Or if you end up with depends, then that is the case where you have semi-stable steady states, meaning sometimes it will go towards this one, sometimes it might go towards another one. Okay. I'll, I'll, we'll do an example in that case. Sorry, and when you graph it, you just graph the steady state. Other questions? M2 was the number of surviving. 
If N2 was the one that survives, they will all go to here. Right. It would not go to here because that's not even a steady, steady state in the first place, right? This would be, if N2 is the only one that survives, you'll go here. Other questions? So yeah, it's a bit long process. It's just something you have to grind out, just like when you were practicing curve sketching, you had all these things you had to check, but eventually you do it enough, you'll, you'll sort of get into a groove, and that's sort of what you want to get into. Um, we have two more examples to do, so let's just do those, and hopefully you'll start to feel more comfortable. So example one was a case where both of them survived. Example two is a case where only N1 survives. I think my third example has only N2 surviving, so you can see that situation. Example C. Let's say this is a problem that showed up on a test. How would it how would it work? So let's deal with com competition first. Now according to Lowe's method, how would this thing look? Go over here, the arrow would go towards that because it's the smaller denominator. And the arrow would go over here because that's the smallest denominator. So we have according to Lowe's method that one which gives us N2. Implicit in this is 0 comma N2. I'm assuming that N1 will die in this case. And so it's non-competitive. N2 survives. Right? And basically this would mean it's clear that N1 is beating up himself more than he's beating up N2, but N2 is beating up the other guy more, so N2 should be the clear winner. All right, that's sort of what happens. Yeah. So on the final, if we do the Lowe's method, that's fine? Like yeah, I'll, I'll be grading your final. I'll, I'll accept it as an uh, official method. Just make sure you said, oh, by Lowe's <coughs> method, you know, state it so I know what you're thinking. In other words, don't just write down this sentence. Tell me how did you get to this sentence. You can say Lowe's method, you draw this little picture and say, okay, that's how we got it. Okay, so that's the competition state. Let's do the analysis. First thing we're going to do is steady states. This is my equation one, that's my equation two. If I set them equal to zero, then from one, they end up with m1 equals zero, or one minus m1 over 50 minus m2 over 25 equals zero. 50 is the LCD, I can multiply through by that. So I have these two situations to worry about. Either n1 is 0 or n1 is this. Deal with these separately. If n1 equals 0, what does that mean? 
plug n1 equals 0 into equation 2. And this would give us n2 equals 0 or 1 minus 2 over 100 equals 0 means n2 equals 100. So this gives us, since n1 is 0 and n2 is 0, this gives us 0 comma 0. Here, n1 is 0 and 2 is 100, so this gives us 0 comma 1. These are two of the steady states. And now we find the other two by examining this situation. minus 2 and 2, so I'm going to plug that into the second. becomes, so this means n2 equals 0 <coughs> or <coughs> 100 is the LCD, I can multiply through by that. I would get 100 minus 50 is just 50 plus n2. So means n2 is equal to minus 50. So if n2 is 0, I just plug in 0 here, I get n1 is 50. And so this steady state is 50 comma 0. n2 is minus 50, I plug it in here, I end up with n1 equals 150. And so this steady state would be 150 comma minus 50. And those are the other two steady states. draw our graph. This is the N1 axis, this is the N2 axis. So remember I go here, if I plug in N2 equals 0, N1 would be 50. One equals zero and two will be twenty-five. And so that's that's the N1 outcome. Go over here, plug in N2 equals zero and one equals a hundred. Plug in N1 equals zero and two is a hundred. And this is our intersection point. It's also a steady state. It is 150 comma minus 50. Our other steady state is 50 comma 0. So this is the other steady state. The other one is the origin. And the other one is 0 comma 100. So these are all the steady states. 
but we know only one is stable. Only n2, 0, comma, n2 is stable. So this is the stable one. So you expect everything to go to that one. Well, let's see how it works. The upper right corner, always this. If I move over here, what happens? Horizontal one switches. So this goes to the right, down, and you end up with that. Right? This is the this is the N2 node point. Now if I jump over here, what happened? Up and right. So I should be going here. And if I jump over here. left and I stay up. So those are the arrows. Now let's plug in some test points, see what happens. Let's say I started here, what's going to happen? Down and to the left, right? So it's going to go. But then I cross that line and what do I have to do now? I'm in this region, so I should be going up and to the left. So I'm going to turn and hit there. What if I start here? I'm in this region, so it's up and to the right. Until I enter there, and I should go up and to the left. So I would turn up there as well. If I start in here, what's going to happen? Just go straight up and to the left. Right? So it's just... Now what can happen is usually they can tell you an initial point. So they'll tell you where they want you to start and then you just follow the arrows and it tells you where to go. But with Lowe's method, you know where you should end up. So if you're doing something and you're not ending up at the end two, you know somewhere you made some incorrect calculations on. That's so. Questions? Okay, let's do fourth example. So we did an example where both survives. The second one was already and one survived. Now this is a two survive. Let's do an example where it actually depends. The competitive case, meaning it depends where we start. This is example E. How would that look? Going down. Our head would go there because that's the smaller denominator. If I draw the N2 arrows, going up because that's the smallest denominator. Which means I end up over here. So the situation is this. So this is the depends case. 
and that means we have competition. We don't know who's win. Each one is beating up the other more than himself. So it's it's really up to who starts off with the stronger foot. So here, this is competitive. Which means, not sure who will win. Um, outcome depends on initial conditions. That's what the depends stand for. Outcome depends on initial condition. So let's see what that would look like here. Analysis. So we'll go for steady states. So in the first equation, we set this equal to zero, which means either n1 equals zero or this equals zero. One hundred is the LCD, so this gives me n2 equals 0, so n1 is equal to 100 minus 2 n2. So this situation or that situation. If n1 equals 0, then equation 2 becomes that 0, so I get n2 equals 0, or 1 minus n2 over zero, which means n2 is 100. So I get two steady states, 0, 0, and 0, 100. Let's do the other situation. n1 is 100 minus 2 and 2. I'm going to plug that in. This means n2. What are our options? Either n2 is 0 or 1 minus n2 over 100 minus. Instead of n1, I'm going to put 100 minus 2 and 2. The LCD here is 100 multiplied through by 100. 25 goes into 100 four times, so this is 4 times 100 minus 2 and 2. So this is 100 minus 400, that's minus 300. Minus N2, this would be plus 8 N2. Minus 4 times this gives me 8 and 2, but I have a minus and 2 here. So that gives me 7. And so now, if n2 is 0, this means n1 is equal to 100, because I just put in 0 here. So that gives me one steady state, 100 comma 0. Or, if n2 is this, that means n1 is... 100 minus 2 times this, 600 over 7. 
so this would be 100 over 7. Right? Because 100 I can write as 700 over 7. 700 minus 600 gives me 100. So that's that. So the other steady state will be 100 over 7, comma, 300 over 7. just want to mention here, there are more shortcuts if you want to take the time to look them up. Um, personally, the algebra doesn't bother me, so I don't really care. But if it bothers you, notice the situations that we have here. There are common themes that you always have. One, either both will be zero, or n1 will be zero while n2 is not zero, or n2 will be zero when n1 is not zero, or they'll both be non-zero. Right? And you can always get each situation um, pretty nicely. So you know when n1 equals 0, your n2 will either be 0 or 100. So you automatically know those two. And in the vice versa case, you can just look at the shortcuts. The numbers here will always show up in a certain position. You always have you know, um, 0, 0, 0, comma, the denominator of n2. Right? Or you would have this comma 0, the denominator of n1 comma 0. And in the last case, that one you can't really see from the picture, but you only set up this system of equations and solve it. Okay, so. so if you don't want like all the algebra, you can do that. But algebra doesn't bother me, so I never bothered memorizing things like that. The Lowe's method is really quick and it tells me where I should end up, so to me that's something worth memorizing. Okay. Um, now let's draw a picture and see what happens. Okay, so remember for this one, you look at what's inside the bracket, set that equal to zero, and solve. So in the top equation, if n2 is zero, n1 is 100. And if n1 is zero, n2 equals 50. This is the N1 null claim. Then you look inside the brackets for the second one. You set 1 minus N2 over 100 minus N1 over 25 equals 0. And one at a time, if N2 equals 0, your N1 is 25. And if N1 equals 0, your N2 is 100. So now I connect those two. This intersection here is going to be that 100 over 7, comma, 300 over 7. And our steady states are this one, this one, the origin, and the other one is your comma, this one. Now let's do our stability arrows. Top right corner, always this. This is the N2 node. So if I'm here, jump over here, what happens? The left arrow turns right. If I jump over here, down arrow turns up. If I jump over here, left and up. Now let's sort of see how this one behaves. What if I start out like right here? 
It's going to go down to the left. You end up here, what do you do? You have to turn around and go down to the right. So that, you're going to, boom, you're going to hit this one. What if you started closer to here, though? Down into the left. But now you end up this region. This one tells you to go up and to the left. So that one's going to turn around and hit that one. Right? I hit a different steady state depending on where I start. What if I started right here? Just go straight there. What if I started here? Straight up to the So you see now I have three semi-stable steady states. I can go to one steady state depending on my initial condition. You see here, if N1 starts with the larger population in relation to N2, N1 is going to win. If vice versa, N2, if the Y value is higher than the X value, N2 will win. Right? If they start with roughly the same, but I guess, you know, then you'll head here or here. Right? So if both populations are very large but roughly the same, they'll go to the middle. If they're very small but roughly the same, they'll go to the middle. If N1 is much larger than N2, he'll win. If N2 is much larger than N1, he'll win. Right? So this is a situation where it depends. Right? It depends where you start. It's real competition. It really depends who gets off on the stronger leg. That's the one that's going to win. Any questions about this one? Are we sort of getting it? How do you feel overall at this time? But you see, it's always like the same process, right? You do this thing, figure out competition, then you set each equation equal to zero, you solve for all the points, then you graph the lines in here equals zero, those give you the null clients. Top right's always gonna look like that, and then you just jump over the lines and change the applicable arrows. And then, and then after that, if they give you an initial condition, you know you have to start there and, and figure out where you end up. Um, typically in the finals, um, they don't let you do this step. They usually don't let you draw this, which is called the phase plot. Um, they might just tell you to go everything up to that, like everything up to the arrow diagrams. But it's possible that they'll ask you to draw one of these given an initial condition. And on a test, I'll ask you to draw this, so you should know how to do it. Any other questions, concerns? Can you explain over time how to do it These? Yeah. Um, top right always looks like this, yeah. left and down. Now, remember where the N1 line comes from? It comes from the top equation. You set the inside of the brackets equal to zero and you, you plug in one equals zero at a time and plot the other one on the axis. Right, so you'll get that line. And then you do something similar for the second equation and you get this other line. And what happens is you start out like this and every time you jump over a line you switch the arrow that deals with that line. Right? So this is the N1 line. N1 controls the horizontal. So it means if I jump over an N1 line I have to switch the horizontal. So here it was left I jumped over here, it now switches right. right. The vertical, I don't do anything because I didn't jump over an N2. Right. To move from this region to over here, I had to jump over this one. That's N2. N2 controls the vertical, which means when I jump over here, the vertical now has to go from down to going up. But the horizontal, I keep it the same. Then I jump over here. This line is the N1 line, which means now the horizontal has to switch. So here it was to the right. When I jump over here, it now goes to the left. But the vertical arrow doesn't change because I didn't jump over N2. Right? So you start like this with the top right, and then every time you jump over N1 line, switch the horizontal. Every time you jump over the N2 line, switch the vertical. And then those arrows actually tell you how you Yeah, the, the arrow tells you when you start here, if you start anywhere in this region, you should be going down and to the left. Right? And if you start anywhere in this region here, there are four regions, one, two, three, four. Starting anywhere in this region, you should be going down and to the right. 
Start anywhere in this region, you should be going up and to the right. Start anywhere in this region, you should be going up and to the left. Yeah, so these arrows tell you how you need to move. Other questions? Um, that was the last exam for this topic, which means chapter six is completed, which means two things. Homework for chapter six is due next class, and the second test will be a week from today, which is next Wednesday, because our second test goes up to chapter six. So the review problems for that, the second test are already on the website, so you go there, practice the review problems, practice all the homeworks. On Monday, I'll deal with any questions you might have, and if we finish in ahead of time, I'll probably jump into chapter seven. I won't start chapter seven now because it's completely different. Chapter seven starts with statistics. It's a completely different mindset, so I don't want to get into that now. We'll actually stop there today. Um, I have tests and quizzes to give back, so you can 